on the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Fifth book of Moses, last book of the Pentateuch, as it's called, Pentamenium 5. We're really mainly concerned with one verse this evening, but let's read the first <clears throat> seven verses of chapter 2, Deuteronomy chapter 2, <clears throat> and then I'll pick us back up on the verse that I'm looking for this evening. Thank you. <clears throat> Deuteronomy meaning and reflecting the second giving of the law to the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse number 1, the word of God says, Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. As the Lord spake unto me, and we compassed Mount Seir many days. And the Lord spake unto me, saying, You have come to this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. And command thou the people, saying, Ye are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir. And they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore. Meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land, no, not so much as a foot breath. Because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. You shall buy meat of them for money that you may eat. And you shall also buy water of them for money that you may drink. For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness these forty years. The Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. And we'll end our reading there this evening. And may God be pleased to bless the reading of his word. Other than to say, let me read verse 3 again, because that will be the substance of our text tonight. You have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. Let's bow our heads and pray and ask the Lord to meet with us tonight. Our Father, we again come before your holy and heavenly word. As heaven speaks to us, as God, you speak to us, because this is your word. And Lord, we know that this is a true account of your dealings with the nation of Israel. But our Heavenly Father, we have much that we can learn for instruction in righteousness and encouragement as you speak to your people today in the New Testament church. Father, I pray that we come tonight with prepared heads and hearts ready to receive from you. Put away the cares and concerns of what has gone before today and what may come next. We may have an, no other moment than we have now. Time may finish for us right now, this evening. And our Heavenly Father, I pray that if that were the case, you'd have our full attention, our full love. Lord, I pray, lead your people tonight. Lead my words tonight. Help me to help these good folks who come out tonight. I want to be a blessing to them. And Father, I know you do, so help me not to get in the way of you being a blessing to these people tonight. Use me as your mouthpiece and messenger, I pray, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, we won't spend too long on the context there. It's, it's kind of a well-known passage. Now, this is, this is the book of Deuteronomy. It's the second given to the Lord. These are Moses', if you will, last words to the nation of Israel. As you know, the book of Joshua comes after that. Moses hands over, Moses dies, hands over the leadership. Uh, oh, well, he hands over the leadership before he dies, obviously, to Joshua, the son of Nun. And then they cross the river Jordan and finally they take and inherit the promised land. But 40 years later than they should have done. They've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And really the second given the law in one sense is Moses' last words to Israel. It's a review of the past problems and a reminder of the present possibilities if they will do what they didn't do first time around. They will be faithful and obedient and trust God. Remember, this was all based on the fact the wandering in the wilderness for 40 years was back there based in Numbers chapter 13. Again, we won't read this tonight. I'm sure you're familiar with this. When the Lord had told them to go up to possess the land of Canaan, the promised land that the Lord had prepared for them. And they sent out spies. First thing, they didn't need to do that, did they? God said, go up and possess the land. Did he say, send out spies? No, he didn't. But they sent out spies. 
And we all know what happened. Ten were bad and two were good. We sing that song with the children. Twelve men went to spy on Cain and ten were bad and two were good. Only two gave a good report, trusting God. Joshua and Caleb. The other ten had no faith in the Lord. You know, with his grasshoppers, they were scared. They didn't trust the Lord. They didn't walk out in faith. They didn't walk out in obedience. They failed in the flesh, were disobedient to the word of God, will of God, and way of God. And God sent them wandering in the wilderness for 40 years as a result of that. Here are we now at the end of this 40 years. You see, as we draw our mind to the text here, it says in verse number three, you've compassed this mountain long enough. Compassed, circled, gone around. That's what they did wandering in the wilderness. Round and around and around and around. Going everywhere, heading nowhere. Just going round and around and around. I wonder tonight, do you ever feel like your life is going around in circles? Do you ever feel like your Christian life is going around in circles? Do you ever feel like you're just not making any progress forwards? Because really that's what this picture's for us tonight. We're not physically walking around Mount Sayyid, but you may be spiritually walking in the wilderness. You may be spiritually feeling like round and round I go, like a child in the park spinning around and around, coming back to the same place, the same place. And we go again, same place, same place. Constantly moving, never getting anywhere, never making any progress. Or not making the progress that you would like to make. Perhaps that's you tonight. Maybe your Christian life has become stationary. I mean, maybe it's become stationary physically. You're not making any physical progress in your life. Maybe it's become uh, stationary emotionally. You're like an emotional wilderness. Maybe your life has become stationary geographically. Maybe there's somewhere that the Lord wanted you to be and you've never got there geographically. You know, maybe maybe he called you to the mission field in, in Africa or somewhere 10 years ago. I don't know. And you never yet have got there. And round and round and round you go. Maybe he called you to a place of service in the local church. Maybe he called you to something. I don't know. Or well, spiritually, you're just not growing. You're going around and around and around. And spiritually, you're the same pygmy that you were last year, five years ago or ten years ago. Do they use that word pygmy anymore? I don't know. You know, Pygmy are little little African tribes people. So they used to have the blow darts, didn't they? Run around. Kalahari? Was it Kalahari? I can't remember. Not a spiritual giant anyway. Sorry, what was that, Benny? You know. You know. What was it? Uh, it, it's not considered to be used today because it might be... Might well, cause offence. Yes. Okay, strike that. Whatever you call a pygmy today, I don't know. So whatever you call a pygmy today, you replace that word. But what I'm saying is we're not growing. We're not becoming the spiritual giants that God would have us to be. We're staying stilted and stunted and dwarf. No, you can't say dwarf. A poor person of restricted growth, isn't it? And that's what we're like as Christians. Round and around and around we go, round and around and we never grow. That's the picture. That was the nation of Israel. And we're reminded that for 40 years they were going around in circles to cover the distance of a journey that would have taken around about 11 days. You see, if you walk the straight route with God, you make great progress. If we go round and around and around in the wilderness, it took them 40 years to get to where they should have been in less than two weeks. Maybe tonight, as you look back over your Christian life, maybe you're wondering why two, five, 10, 30, 40 years it's taken you to get a distance of two weeks of Christian life and living. I don't know. So why was it? It was a result of rebellion. It was a result of lack of faith. It was a result of lack of obedience. And that's important for us to understand here tonight. In fact, there's only two places 
in the scriptures where God says you've come to this man long enough. That phrase, just go with me, Deuteronomy chapter 1. Just turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse number 6, I think it is, yes. <clears throat> exactly the same thing. The Lord our God spake unto us in horror, that's the man, saying, ye have dwelt long enough. In this man, that's the only two times in the scripture God says it, and it's in relation to the nation of Israel wandering in the wilderness, not doing what God called them to do. And God says, you're going around in circles, you're getting nowhere. Now you've done that for long enough. Now it's time to change. Now it's time to go where you should have gone so long ago. Basically, the Lord had withheld them, the nation of Israel, from the place of promise. He had withheld them from the place of his promise. They couldn't have walked in there even if they'd wanted to. God held them back. God held them back from everything that he had prepared for them. And he did it for 40 years until the generation of faithlessness and disobedience had died out. Remember, none of those adults in that nation, except for Moses, Caleb, and Joshua, would live to go into the promised land. God says, you're going around in circles until those who are faithless and disobedient are dead. Then you go in. See, God needed to shed the faithlessness and the disobedient. My dear Christian friend, I want this tonight. If you feel like you're going around in circles in your Christian life, is it down to faithlessness or disobedience in your life? And God's keeping you going round and round and round in circles until your faithlessness and your disobedience are put to death. And only then can you enter into the promised land, the place of blessing. We're reminded in verse number seven, would you look with me, that even for those 40 years in the wilderness, God never left them. God never left them. God didn't uh, remove the covenant blessing from them. Look at verse number seven. For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. Blessed who the faithless, rebellious, and disobedient were still blessed. Why? Because among the faithless and rebellious and disobedient were the young and the faithful who had committed no sin. And God blessed even the rebellious and disobedient to bless the faithful and obedient. For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness these 40 years. The Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. Nothing. God was with them all through the wilderness years. God provided for them all through the wilderness years. They lacked faith. They lacked obedience. But God was with them all through it. God provided all the way through. Even in that time, the Lord had not forsaken them. The Lord had still blessed them. And the Lord had still provided for them. But what had now happened... And very often it's a result of routine and repetition, isn't it? They had become comfortable going around and around and around in circles. They got used to going around in circles. The necessities were still provided by the Lord. The Lord was still with them. And they got comfortable in that position. They had become comfortable going around in circles. They'd learned to adapt to that life. They'd learned to do all that they could and all that they needed to to continue on in that life. But what they learned to do was to accept and be comfortable with less than God had for them. They were operating on less than God's fullness of blessing. They were operating on less than God's promise. They were operating on less than the promised land, the place of blessing. Now, now let me be very clear here with you, you tonight. The land of Canaan in the Bible to the nation of 
of Israel was the physical land of promise, the kingdom of heaven. For you and I, the promised land in the Bible does not represent heaven because there were still battles and there was still sin. The land of Canaan, the promised land to the Christian, represents the place of blessing here on earth. It's the place where the Christian should reside in the center of God's provision, in the center of God's blessing, in the center of God's best. But here's the truth of it. How many Christians get used to wandering around in the wilderness and just are adapting to living off God's scraps? While the place of blessing and the place of promise where he would have you to be, the place you enter into by faith and obedience is sat empty because you wander around and around and around in the wilderness doing the same thing over and over again. And every once in a while, I've been here before, off we go again. I've been here before, off we go again. We become comfortable with the familiar, don't we? That's what we're like as human beings. It kind of doesn't matter how things are. Once we learn and adapt how to deal with them, then we become comfortable even in our discomfort because that becomes our routine. And we be and God's best for us. And we sell ourselves short. If you will, we go around and around in circles. That's the picture of the nation Israel here. We just keep treading the same trail over and over and over again. We just keep walking the same ground over and over and over again. Let me ask you something. When you keep walking the same trail over and over and again, what do you get? A rut. And some smart person, I don't know who, defined what a rut is. It's a grave with the ends kicked out. Never ends. You're in the hole, and on and on and on it goes. You walk the same trail, you get deeper in the trail, you get more comfortable in the trail, you get deeper and deeper in, and then you're in the rut. And it just goes on and on and on, round and around and around. Now, let me tell you this. The devil wants to do all he can to harm and hinder you from going to the place of God's blessing. We looked a little bit at that on Friday evening, didn't we? He has that power. He has that opportunity if we let him. But can I tell you this? As much as the devil wants to harm and hinder you from getting to the place of blessing, most of the time he doesn't have to do too much because we're quite happy to do it for ourselves. We're quite happy to make the choices that harm and hinder us and prevent us from getting to the place of God's blessing and get to the place of God's best. We make the wrong choices. We make the wrong decisions. We become faithless. We become disobedient to the word, will of God and the word of God. You see, we get used to our rut of comfort. No matter how bad or how deep that rut is, we get used to it, and that becomes our daily wandering in the wilderness. The promised land to the Christian, the place of God's blessing. That is where God wants every single one of us to be. Jesus Christ spoke of it in John, the abundant Christian life. Quite frankly, honestly, I speak to, to a number of Christians and they'd almost laugh in your face when you talk to them about the abundant Christian life. They've never experienced it. They don't know what it's like. Why? Because they're wandering in the wilderness. Can't see a way out. Can't see a way forward. Can't see a way back. As far as you can see forward, same rut. As far as you can see backwards, same rut. God says, you've compassed this mountain long enough. What's God saying? It's time to get out of the rut. Long enough, God says, enough. Stop wandering in the wilderness. It doesn't matter how comfortable you are. 
God does not want you to be in the wilderness. He wants you to be in the place of blessing. Don't choose the wilderness. God has the perfect position and place of blessing marked out for you and marked out for me. Turn with me to Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. All well-known scriptures tonight, not going anywhere obscure. Jeremiah 29. I just want you to be reassured of what the Lord has for you. He wants you in that place of his blessing and his best. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Do we get our thoughts messed up sometimes by circumstances? Anybody ever thought God was against us? You ever a point in your life and you think, I think God's against me. And God says, your thinking's all wrong. He says, for I know the thoughts that I have toward you. God says, you, you're getting this wrong. You're in, a, you're in the rut. You can't see. All you can see is that way forwards, that way backwards. You can't see me. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me. Now, this is a conditional promise. When you shall search for me with how much of your heart? All your heart. So God says we get our thoughts jumbled up from wandering around in the wilderness for so long. We get comfortable in the wilderness. We think God can't help us. We think God's against us. And God says you need to understand you don't know correctly the thoughts that I have toward you. You think I'm against you? God says I'm for you. You think I don't want to bring peace in your life? God says I do want to bring peace in your life. God says we say every day is a calamity. God says you have an expected end. So how do I get there? God says get on your knees and pray. And you search for me, but don't make it half-hearted. Don't come with your half-hearted confessions to the Lord. Don't come with your half-hearted prayers. Don't come with your half-hearted schemes. You shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. God says it's time to get out of the rut, and you can only do it when you search for God with all your heart. You say, that's too difficult. I, I don't know. Some of you put all your heart into sin sometimes. You go full on for that. Try that the other way around. Try giving your heart to the Lord. Now, let me say this, and certainly we know this from the text, but there's other scriptures that we could put into place, and it's true. Going around in circles can be a sign of rebellion and a sign of faithlessness. Yes, it can. But also, going around in circles is sometimes the Lord's way of preparing us. We're not quite ready. Go around again. Take another lap. Yeah, not quite there. Go around again. Take another lap. And God each time is preparing us for something. And we'll go around in circles until we're ready to take that next step. Now, let me say this. Going around in circles as a sign of rebellion and going around in circles as a sign of preparedness, both were represented in the wilderness wanderings of the nation of Israel, right? Because they went around 40 years while the children were growing up in faith, watching the faithless die. And God was going, I'm cleaning out the faithless, but I'm preparing you. You're going around in circles to be prepared for the promised land. These guys are going around in circles because they're faithless and disobedient. And I'm just watching them die off. And then the faithful can go forward as a body. Sometimes God will do that in the church, you know, take you around and around in circles because he's waiting for the faithless to die off and the faithful to be prepared. But in an individual basis, you may be going around in circles, you may be walking in the rut because of rebellion, disobedience and faithlessness, or because God is preparing you for something for which you are not yet or have not been yet quite ready. 
a quote that's attributed to C.S. Lewis, but I actually couldn't find the reference, so uh, I'm just going to tell you it, and I'll, I'll, I'll ascribe it to C.S. Lewis, but I'm not 100% certain. Hardship often prepares ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. Did you get that? Hardship often prepares ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. Sometimes God will put you around in circles to prepare you for something incredible. That when you engage with faithfulness and obedience, all of a sudden, the years of wilderness wandering form the basis for the preparedness. Tribulation worketh patience. And patience, experience. And experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, for the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Two simple things. That's all by way of introduction. Two simple things in verse three. It's time to get out of the rut. God says, long enough. How do you get out of the rut? Decision, direction. Look at verse number three. You've compassed this mountain long enough. God says, it's time now. You make the decision. Now you go into the promised land. Do you understand? God won't force anything upon anybody. He says, long enough. The nation of Israel have said, do you know what? I think we'll just keep going around in circles. God would have gone, okay. Around in your circles you go. Or Joshua would have led a few faithful ones into the promised land. And the rest would have never, ever got to the place of blessing and promise. And God would have let them do that because he lets you make your choices. They had to make a decision. God said, long enough. They said, okay, Lord, what will you have us to do? And, of course, that was follow Joshua, step out in faith, cross the river, put your foot out, the river dried up, and to the promised land they went. Christian, I'm saying to you tonight, God says long enough in the wilderness, enough. But he won't force you. That says you need to make a decision. Follow me faithfully. Trust me faithfully. Be obedient to all that I say to you to do and do it faithfully. That's the decision we all have to make as Christians. There's, there's two major decisions in the Christian life. The first is to become a Christian, right? Sins forgiven, to accept the gospel of the grace of God, to trust Christ as our saviour, to receive Christ as our saviour. That's a decision God allows us to make in our own free will. He forces it upon nobody. That's decision number one. But in some point... Every Christian in their Christian life and walk at some point has to make the decision then to trust God in their Christian life, to trust his word, to trust his goodness, to trust his direction, to trust that he knows the end from the beginning, to trust that he knows better than you and I do, and to trust that he's revealed that in his word and we must follow faithfully in obedience we must make that decision. How often do we, just like people in the world, we get settled, stranded, and surrounded by sin, and we make our life in the midst of it. We get comfortable with sin in our life. And God says, long enough. Long enough. Touch not the unclean thing. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. That's what he's saying to the nation of Israel. Long enough. But he won't force you and he won't force me. But I wonder tonight, is the Lord saying to you, long enough? Long enough. Make the decision. You see, and secondly, <clears throat> he said to them, it's long enough. Not only you must make, you make the decision, but God gave them the, the direction. It's one thing to make a decision, but you need a direction. How many times over the last few years of uh, of, of you or I and a number of people in this church been praying for direction. So like, I've made the decision. God, just direct me. Sometimes that's the toughest prayer to make, isn't it? Looking for the direction. Becca was sharing uh, with us this afternoon a, a quote uh, from Amy Carmichael from a, a book, If, and I'm going to paraphrase it. 
But it basically says what you've heard me say many times before. Don't pray unless you actually want an answer. And if you get the answer, you better be ready to act on it. Don't mock God. For God will not be mocked. If you pray, you want an answer, you'd be prepared to get the answer. But don't pray expecting an answer if you're not prepared to act upon the answer. There's an old phrase that goes, light rejected becomes lightning. God will give you light, but he expects you to work and act upon that light. And he will bless you and reveal more light as you do. You see, they, they make the decision. God said long enough. They said, okay, God, where should we go? Turn you northward, he said. Verse number three. Turn you northward. Turn from your rut. Turn from walking around in circles. Stop. Hear the word of the Lord. Go in the direction that he sent them. Northward. Now, to them, geographically, if you take the time to look in the Bible, maps in the back of your Bible, probably you'll see that was a geographical north. They were south of where they needed to be. They were Kadesh Barnea. They were down south. They needed to go up north, travel northwards as the compass points, if you will, basically get to the promised land, cross the River Jordan, and go into the promised land. Northward is the direction that was given to the nation of Israel to get to the place of blessing. <clears throat> Christian, do you know where northward is for you? Do you know God says the same to you? Go north. But it doesn't mean we've all got to move to Scotland. Or maybe a bit further north, like Svalbard, the, the, the Norwegian uh, um, uh, islands up there. It doesn't, it doesn't mean just get as far north as you can. You know, get from the bottom of the country to the top of that's geographical north. But now think with me, now you picture the world, you picture the globe. Where's north? Up. What's up? Heaven. God says you go north. You make the decision to get out of the rut, what direction? Up. So what do you mean, Colossians 3? Colossians 3. You make the decision, God's given us the direction. I'll get there in a minute. Colossians chapter 3, I'm sure you know it well. This is the direction for the Christian who's made the decision. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where's that? North. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then she also appear with him in glory. Mortify, put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idol idolatry, etc., etc. God says, you make the decision. God says, long enough have you gone on in sin. Long enough have you been comfortable in the rut. Long enough you've gone comfortable in the place that is outside of God's best and God's blessing for you. Long enough, make the decision to move your direction where I'm sending you. So where's that, God says, get your head in heaven. Get your thoughts upon heavenly things. Put to death these members of our flesh which want to grab hold of the earthly things that keep us in the rut, the grave with no end. Christian on this world is living a life of carnal activity, death to our spiritual blessings, death 
to the best that God wants to give us. You're living in the wilderness. God says, if you've made the decision, here's the direction. Get your head in heaven. How do you get your head in heaven? You get your eyes in the book. That's how you get your head in heaven. Get your eyes in the book. You see, the mind is the Christian battlefield. Christian, where's your mind tonight? Is it south in the sewer? Or is it up in heaven? Where is your mind? The rut you're wearing is wearing you down. The rut you are wearing will wear you down. Look up. Get out of the rut. God says it's been long enough. Long enough. God's spoken to you tonight and told you that it's been long enough. You make the decision. You follow God's direction. He'll bless you if you're obedient to the Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Christian, I'm just going to ask you to take a moment tonight. I don't want to see any hands. I don't want you to walk forward. I just want you to sit there a moment and let the Lord speak to you. Is the Lord impressing upon your heart tonight something of your life? Something of a wilderness experience. Something where you've grown comfortable with less than God's best. Is God showing you something in your life or your entire life is in a rut? And you just keep going round and round and round, but always ending up in the same place. Question is God calling you tonight? Is God saying to you tonight, long enough, enough, make a decision, make a decision to go in God's direction. If so, then you take a moment now with the Lord. Confess your sin, confess your rebellion, confess your faithlessness, confess your carnality to him. Seek his cleansing again, because it's on offer. Vow to the Lord, I've made a decision. I will go your direction, Lord. Never again will I walk in the wilderness. Never again. Never again will I plow the rut of this world, a Christian graveyard. But I will go your direction. I will go to the place of your blessing in the place of your best. Our Father, we thank you, dear God, for your word tonight. Father, every one of us in here tonight would have to admit there's times in our life when we are, we feel like we're in the wilderness. We're wandering around in circles. Sometimes it's because of our rebellion. Sometimes it's because of your preparation. But our Lord, I pray we'd hear your voice saying long enough. And we'd make that decision to go your direction. We'd set it. We'd mark it. We'd raise up an Ebenezer stone of remembrance on the day we decide to follow you by trusting in Christ or the day we decide to follow you trusting your word in fullness and in faith. Claiming the promise of your blessing and your best for your children. Lord, I pray if there's any dear Christian in here tonight in the wilderness that tonight is long enough. Father, if there's any dear Christian tonight entering into the wilderness, that they'll stay their heart, Lord, and they'll not go round in circles. They'll stop and follow you. Oh, Lord, may each of us tonight desire and dedicate our lives to your best and your blessing. It's time, Lord to get out of the rut. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.